Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is John with Murder by the Book coming to you with another uh, live virtual event. Tonight, we're really excited to have Annalie Huber with us. Uh, you guys may have remember we chatted with her a couple of weeks ago for uh, the collection Deadly Hours. But today, we're here to talk to her about A Pretty Deceit, which is her new release. It technically comes out tomorrow. It is the fourth book in the Verity Kent series. How are you tonight, Anna? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad we, we got to do this. Um, so to start off really easy, can you tell us a little bit about the newest book in the series? Absolutely. So um, fans of the series will know at this point, she kind of has an arch nemesis in Lord Ardmore. It's kind of my take on a Moriarty type figure. And at the beginning of the book, they're kind of off pursuing some other clues and um, she's contacted by her father and her her aunt, her father's sister, um, has run into some trouble. Um, during the, the Great War, I think, um, like a lot of people have seen Dou uh, Downton Abbey and they know that like the manor houses were often used as hospitals and things like that. But they were also used for other purposes, like they housed um, military officers and things like that. And her home was used to house some officers for the Royal Flying Corps and then Royal Air Force. Um, and they've done some damage to the estate. And so um, she's called to complain and ask for help. Um, but there's also some other shady things going on. There's a missing maid, there's some artwork missing. Um, so all kinds of things that are just don't quite add up. So Verity and Sydney are asked to visit and to look into matters and a servant drops dead. And uh, so they're kind of off on a mystery once again, as well as pursuing uh, the leads on trying to find out what exactly Lord Ardmore is up to, what his ultimate plot is. Awesome. Um, so this is the fourth in the series. Have, when you started, do you have kind of an, an overarching like kind of plot for the character and where she's going to go over the course of the series? With Verity, I didn't have as big of a overarching plot. I kind of, I had several different ideas I wanted to pursue. Um, it's kind of interesting with Lady Darby, I really plotted out a long way, but with Verity, I kind of left myself the door open because I wasn't exactly sure where I wanted to go and exactly which direction. Um, I've mentioned this before that um, initially her husband was going to stay dead. And then he showed up while I was writing the first book. And I just loved that change in the plot and I loved getting to explore a marriage and trouble and you know being separated from war and all the secrets you keep um and so that really shifted the series and also you know getting to explore different elements of the her work with the secret service during the war and getting to have flashbacks and things like that so I didn't really have a big arc um and I'm you know I still don't have a big arc um, and I'm kind of enjoying it being, you know, a little less planned out. So it's, it's kind of more, it's a different, I'm exercising a different part of my brain, I guess. And, and guys, uh, if you're watching on Facebook while we are chatting, if you guys have any questions for Anna about um, this series, about the Lady Darby books, about Deadly Hours or kind of writing in general, you can drop those in the comments and we will get to those in just a little bit. So Anna, what was it about um, this time period that made you want to start a second series? So I've always been really interested in World War I. I think it's because in school, it tended to be the war in the US at least, that we kind of just skip over. Like we would jump just very briefly go through it just to get to World War II. And I always wondered more about it. And so when I got older, I started reading books about it, history books. And I always wanted to set a series there, but I couldn't find the right, you know, hook. Um, and then I started looking into the British Secret Service and there's all these declassified documents now from the 1990s and the 2000s, they declassified these documents from the World War I era and discovered that there were thousands of women that worked um, in the various intelligence agencies and in the resistance networks during that war that don't get the credit that they really deserve. I mean, and it's so much fascinating, good material. And it was just an embarrassment of riches to work with. And once I found that treasure trove of stuff, I was like, okay, here we go. This is a perfect mystery series idea with a great backstory. And that's really what made me excited about writing this series. It's, it's nice because like you said, like there, there are tons of really great World War II series out there, but we have people come in all the time and they ask, hey, we've read, you know, Charles Todd, Maisie Dobbs, Susan McNeil. We read all of these World War II things, but about World War I and we're always like, 
there's like four of them. Um, so it's, it's nice to have kind of that time period um, represented. What kind Thank of, uh, so uh, what kind of research did you do? Like, where did you discover all of these unclassified documents? Um, so I first stumbled across it on the actual MI6's website. Um, and then I started digging into news articles about it. And then there's been a number of books written by people who delved into those declassified documents. There was articles about um, people whose great grandmothers were suddenly allowed to tell their family what they'd done, you know, because then none of them had known, none of them. And so reading about these ladies and then there's some memoirs. Um, I actually stumbled across a book um, by um, Captain um, Henry Landau and he was in charge of the military section in Rotterdam, Holland. And he basically ran the resistance intelligence gathering networks within Belgium during the latter part of the war. And so his memoir was just filled with so much good information. Um, and it was firsthand account. And he actually wrote it about a decade after World War I, so before World War II, but he did it in the US because if he'd done it in Great Britain, he would have been um, arrested and tried because he was sharing secrets. So um, anyway, so kind of an interesting thing about him. Um, and so a lot of that was my wealth of material for that. Um, so it was just a lot of different places and letters and um, there's a memoir by uh, Marta Knockert, uh, Marta, what's her married name, McKenna. Um, she was actually a spy. She was a Belgian citizen, but she was a spy for the British. Um, and some of it's a little, you're not sure if she's telling the truth, but Winston Churchill wrote the foreword. So a lot mm -hmm. of it is true. And, and she was mentioned in uh, dispatches and things. So that gave a lot of great, um, fascinating information. And people can find those memoirs, you know, if they want to read them themselves. So. What was the most surprising thing you discovered while you were doing research? Hmm. Um, I was extremely impressed with how um, within Belgium, in the resistance networks, the women were equals. I mean, like they were, I mean, at that era, it was still very much, you know, the men were in charge, the women followed orders and, or they weren't allowed near, you know, but this was a different situation. You know, they were under German occupation and they, a lot of, in a lot of instances, the women were the ones taking the most risk because they weren't suspected. Um, they flew under the radar, but they also held commanding positions and they were respected for it. Um, and the main resistance network that I focus on is La Dame Blanche, which was the prototype for the World War II resistance networks that, you know, came up when the Nazis invaded. Um, but their prototype, it worked so well and it was, it was militarized, basically. They all took oaths, there was, they buried, they had a dog tag that they basically buried so that they could prove they were part of it. And it was so, it was really a fascinating um, infrastructure. And one of their big things was that they insisted on being a military organization when they agreed to work with the British. And after the war, there was a big fight over whether they would get medals as military division. And the main reason was because half their members were women and they didn't give out military medals, medals to women. So I just found all of that really, really interesting. Uh, so Keith asked in the, the comments, he says, and hey, Keith, how are you? Uh, Keith says, the research sounds so fascinating. How are you able to stop researching and actually start writing? It's hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I usually am doing research almost all the time, um, just as I'm writing and doing other things. But um, when I am doing a particular book, it's like I kind of set a, like a timeline down for myself and I know that I have to stop and start writing at a certain point or the book won't get done. And I've just learned that's kind of, I have to just do that with myself and hope that I've got all the, the information I need and I haven't missed a book or, you know, all those kind of things. And I'm always doing research even while I'm writing the things that come up you just didn't catch before that you specifically need. But it's really just kind of a, you just have to do the best you can because you're a fiction writer, not a historian, so. So that was gonna be my next question. So you're doing your research, you're writing the book. How do you, how do you gauge when you can potentially fudge something if you don't have the details and when do you like think like no I actually have to nail this right or I'm gonna get letters <laughs> um well if I am trying my hardest and spending hours and I cannot find it then I a lot of times will assume most people can't um 
And the other thing is, if it's something that I feel like I really should be able to find this, but I haven't been able to, then I will try to write around it. So I'm not necessarily speaking in specifics, but generalizations so that hopefully that covers over anything that I've, that I've not got fully grasped. So, and I think having a general, a lot of it's guesswork too, because it's having a general understanding of the mindset of the people of that era and the things they went through and all those things and, or even just a specific character and how they would think and react about something. So, um, yeah, so it, it's kind of a mix. Yeah. And, and is the research something that gets easier when you're, you know, four books or six books into a series, just because you're a little bit more familiar with the time period. So you don't have to kind of start over every time. Absolutely. Yeah. When I first start a series or a new time period, specifically, it's really a deep dive because you've got to have, you know, the, the clothing, the food, the language. Um, I love reading letters and diaries and things from a certain era or even music and things like that, uh, because it really gives you a, the, a feel for the flow of the language and, um, you know, all those kind of things. So it's a really big deep dive. And then for each book further into the series, you do grow much more comfortable with the era. And it kind of depends on what the book is about. Like some books require a lot more research, if, especially if you're going to a different place or you're exploring a specific event in history and you want to get it right. Whereas others, you're set in the era, but you're not necessarily using specific details. So it's a little less research because you're already grounded. It's interesting, Deanna Rayburn says uh, when she starts her research, she always likes to find kind of like diaries and travel logs of the time period too, because like, you get kind of more details like how things look and how things smell and you can kind of get more rich details that way. And Absolutely. I mean, it, it just grounds you because it's firsthand. It's those people that lived then. And yeah, definitely. So you, you're doing two series now. When you sit down to write kind of a Verity book versus writing a Lady, Lady Darby book, you kind of already mentioned that one of them, you kind of a little bit more plot and one's a little less, but um, how do you prepare yourself to kind of switch between the characters? Um, well, it's, it's, I, it sounds very crazy, but in my mind, they almost inhabit different areas of my brain. I don't, that's the only way I can explain it. And a lot of it for me comes down to their language. It's like I can almost adopt a different posture and a different language. And that tells me I'm in the right head of which character. Because I mean, if if Kira is speaking in 1920 slang, then I know I'm not in the right head. <laughs> So that's a big part of it for me. And I, I, you know, I try to listen to music that's kind of from the era too. That helps, you know, and uh, just I, a big part of it is just even when you're first starting a book doing description, because you, if you're really setting the scene for the reader, but you're also setting it for yourself, even if it's not the very first part of the book, like just diving into that, it gets you in that era. Have you posted, um, like you said, you, you mentioned music from the eras. Do you have like Spotify playlists for that, you, that like you've shared for people to like check out what you listen to when you write? For eras? I don't, I yeah. should, but um, I've been asked that before. I, I am one of those people who can't listen to um, words. I have to have mm -hmm. instrumental. So a lot of it's like soundtracks, um, music, movie soundtracks, or just like the classical music that was written in that era, that kind of thing. So um, so I don't really have a spot. I should do that. One of these days I will. <laughs> I love that. I think Jeff Abbott says, uh, lots of authors actually mentioned that like they, they like to listen to movie soundtracks as they're writing. And it seems like that would be kind of a good, you know, you get those like really big dramatic moments. It seems like that would be a great thing to listen to as you're plotting something. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's certain ones that'll hook on to different books. Like, um, they're the Lady Darby book, it's Mortal Arts, but I, for some reason, I was listening to the Inception soundtrack like a ton when I wrote that book. So now if I listen to that soundtrack, I'm instantly back in that book. And so there's others where I'm, I, there's not specifically one that latches to it, but it's, it's funny how some of them just fit something so perfectly. Um, so Gail says in the comments, she loves the book cover for this one. I'm gonna hold it up just so everybody can see it a little better as well um there's the cover did you have any input on the cover um so they always ask me for like um cover art ideas um and they usually go with um a lot of my thoughts um but then they just take it to such another level i mean so it's i can't claim a whole lot <laughs> <laughs> 
they do such an excellent job and the lady darby series i mean they do such a fantastic job so yeah, they do um so what's it like working with uh different editors and different publishers for each series um so each editor i've been really lucky i work with some great teams and great editors and i don't I, I mean, I, I've heard horror stories, so I feel so lucky with the people that I get to work with because I really have no complaints. And it's it's kind of, you can tell they're a different personality. And so sometimes when I'm writing to one editor over the other, I know which, you know, which they'll find funny and what the other will find funny, that kind of thing. Um, you know, and even my publicists and the other members of the team. So it's, um, and they all have different, um, you know, they all follow the basic same pattern, but they all have different um, ways of doing things. And so it's just kind of that adjustment also. But um, yeah, in general with traditional publishing, I think they all pretty much follow the same kind of template and timeline. So that makes it easy on us who, who have multiple publishers. <laughs> There's not a lot of surprises, so. Um, George wants to know, do you find yourself slipping into that era's language and mannerisms while you're talking with others as you're working on a book? I do sometimes, especially as I'm getting close to a deadline, um, because I'm just living in that era so much. Um, my husband will tease me about it a lot or, you know, I'll use a word with my, I have a three-year-old, a six-year-old, and he'll use a, a word and he'll be like, they don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> but I'm like, hey, I'm just expanding their vocabulary. <laughs> uh, are you familiar with Mary Robinette Kowal at all? She does kind of historical fantasy stuff. Yes, yes. So she does a, um, her series that's finished now, now she's doing kind of um, alternate history space stuff, but she was doing this series that was sort of Jane Austen pastiche, but with magic in it. And she actually created this database that was like all of the words that Jane Austen used in all of her books. And she would spell check her own books against them. And if a word popped up that Jane Austen didn't use, she would actually like go back and try to figure out what the etymology of that word was and whether it would be actually used in that period or not. Wow, that's that crazy. I, mean, I use etymology dictionaries. I'm always checking myself, but not to that level. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, um, they're super fun books. And every time she's, she would say that when she would come to the store, I'd be like, oh my gosh, that sounds like so much work. That's what I was just thinking. I'm like, whoa, like <laughs> she could sell that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Andrea wants to know, what are you currently reading? Um, so I am reading uh, Andrea Penrose's latest, uh, Murder at Queen's Landing. I think is that right? Um, that sounds right. I I just finished, um, oh, I just finished a book by Karen Hawkins called The Book Charmer, which I just loved. Um, I just got, what I'm reading next is I um, am blurbing um, Ashley Weaver's first book in her new series. So I'm really excited about that. Um, yeah, so I guess <laughs> so lots of stuff, but that's what I've, the most recent. <laughs> yeah, I'm really excited about that Ashley Weaver, her new series. I'm a big fan of the, the Milo, um, uh, uh, and Amory book. So I'm excited to see what she's going to do next. Me too. And I know, I think this idea is just fantastic. It's a good mm -hmm. idea. <laughs> so um, it's, you know, we, we hear a lot from people that as they're writing something in a specific genre, they're not able to read in it because they're worried about, um, you know, just kind of it slowly seeping in. Is that something that you, that you worry about or are you just able to kind of separate the two? I don't really worry about it. Um, I do sometimes consciously um, read, like I'm writing very Cat 5, and so I'm reading mm -hmm. more like Regency right now. Um, so it's, I mean, I do, but I don't. So I don't, I don't worry about it too much, but I do sometimes purposely try not to read in the exact era when I'm writing in that era. So, yeah. <laughs> and so as you're reading for pleasure, are you able to just kind of t turn off the writer part of your brain or are you slowly like thinking, okay, this didn't work. Why didn't this work? Or this really did. How did they do that? Um, I don't think I, I, I definitely, it's hard to totally turn off the author brain. Um, I definitely, I'm, I'm more prone to DNFing to do not finish a book <laughs> than I used to be just because there are sometimes, I mean, not usually I can just not worry about it. I mean, it may, I'll be like, oh, and then I'll just read on, but there's other times when if it's just really irking me, I can't, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess so. I guess yes, I have issues, but it's not. I'm not super stringent. It's not like I'm like, you know, instantly this. Oh, this didn't work. That's the wrong word for this era. I'm done. You know, <laughs> so I'm not overly critical. But yeah, definitely it does. 
I think it does. I think it it's just hard not to. So <laughs> I'm a I'm a big proponent of do not finishing books if it's something that's just not working for you. And you know, sometimes you can tell like this isn't working for me because I'm not in the mood for this specific genre, or this isn't working for me because this isn't for me. Like there, there's so much stuff out there. I'm a big proponent of if it's not doing it for you, set it aside. That's exactly it. When I was younger, I used to be like, no, I have to finish it. And, and now I'm like, no, there's too many great books in the world. Why am I? And sometimes I can even tell when I'm reading something, I'm like, okay, this isn't working for me now, but it might work for me in a couple months. So I'll set it aside and like pick it up later, you know? And, and there's other times too, when you can tell, like a lot of times it's not that the book isn't well-written. It just doesn't work for you for whatever reason. So Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so George says, uh, you are a music major. What is your favorite instrument to play or listen to? And what do you listen to day to day? <laughs> so I was a vocal music major, opera. <laughs> wow. um, but instrument wise, I love violin. Oh my goodness. I don't play it, but I love it. Um, I love, I played oboe. So I'm really partial to oboe. Um, I would say those are my two top um, instruments. And I have a lot of classical music that I like to listen to. Um, and I also like kind of odd things. Like I love the Mozart quintets, not the quartet, <laughs> which there's a few of. There's not a whole lot, but I, I, it's something quirky. I just love them. So. <laughs> um, so Keith wants to know, do you have a time of day that you set aside to write or is it any time you have a free half hour? <laughs> so this year has been a little wacky because of the pandemic. <laughs> I think everybody's experienced this. Yeah. Um, and I have young children. So when my um, six-year-old was out of school, that was tricky. But now that we're back and they are in school and it's going well so far, <laughs> um, my optimal day is that I get up and get my six-year-old on the bus at seven and then I get to work. And my husband's working at home right now. So he watches our three-year-old in the morning while he's trying to get some work and emails and things done. And then um, she goes down for a nap after lunch. And then I get my um, six-year-old off the bus and I have the kids while he works. So um, so optimally my day is about seven to two um, if I'm lucky. <laughs> so I always write better in the morning. So I'm always arguing to have the morning work time because I just get so much more done. Um, in the afternoon, I get that sluggish brain and I just, it doesn't, doesn't come out as well. <laughs> and so have you been able to, you know, to, to kind of focus and kind of let the creative wheels turn with kind of every, the, the chaos of everything going on? It's been up and down. Um, I ended up having to ask for a deadline extension for my June deadline book because everything had just happened and the kids were out of school and I was having to help my kindergartner because kindergartners can't do remote learning themselves. <laughs> so, um, so that was tricky. It's gotten better. Um, although now that the election's coming up, I'm having, I'm finding myself having to like ban, so not look at social media because I get all worked up. <laughs> so I think this is a really hard year for a lot of creative time for everybody, honestly. I mean, so yeah, there's, it's been up and down. There's been times when I've really been able to concentrate well and then other times when I haven't. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely, you know, you take advantage of those times when things are flowing and, you know, then on the alternate side, don't beat yourself up on those times when it's just not working. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so I don't think that I've actually um, heard you talk about this, but can you tell us a little bit about your path to publication? Sure. Um, so I always wrote as a kid. I had my own mystery solving teens that I wrote a couple books about, you know, um, and then I kind of, as a teenager, I got, I was more into music and I decided that's what I'd go to college for. I kind of let the writing fall by the wayside. And then I graduated uh, with my bachelor's degree and I was kind of undecided whether I wanted to go on to get my master's. Cause if you were gonna do vocal performance um, you really had to have the master's um, or did I want to do something else? So I kind of took some time off and I started reading for pleasure again. And I hadn't really read any mysteries in a while. I'd read them all the time when I was younger. But like, as everybody knows, when you're in college, like all you're doing is reading your stuff for class, you know? So I started reading a bunch more and I was like, man, I really miss this. Oh, I, I remember when I used to write. And so it's funny, I remember distinctly, it was like a year after I got out of um, college, um, the, the Memorial Day weekend, that three day weekend, I had no work and I wasn't going anywhere. And I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take this whole weekend and just write and just see what happens. And maybe I'll love it, maybe I'll hate it, whatever. And 
basically I've never looked back because <laughs> as soon as I started doing it, I realized I, this was what I was meant to do. This is what I needed to do. And so, you know, I worked while I was writing and it took me seven years to get published. And I have all those manuscripts that'll be never see the light of day, you know, <laughs> I had to get better. But um, yeah, so that was basically what got me started, so. And so what drew you to historical fiction and, and specifically historical mysteries? So I've always loved history. It was my favorite um, subject in school other than music. Um, and I don't know, it just always fascinated me. I like reading just history, straight history books. And initially I just read a lot of mystery and I kind of, and then I was reading romance and I was trying to figure out exactly what I, what I wanted to read. And then I actually read um, Deanna Rayborn's Silent in the Grave. And I realized, oh my gosh, this is the exact com you know, combination I wanted to write, you know? Cause I had read historical romance. I'd read his historical fiction. I'd read mystery, but I'd never really read a book that had all three. And so that's really kind of what like cemented into my mind. And cause that's, and then once I found her and I started reading all these other authors, I was just like, this is it. And so it's what I loved. And so it's just what I, what I write. So. Yeah. As, as, as everybody watching knows, we're, we're huge Deanna Rayburn fans of the store. I got to meet her before I started working at Murder by the Book. I had um, helped open up one of the borders uh, in the mall in the area and she had dropped by just for a stock signing. And I was like, oh, this book sounds good. Will you sign? And so I got her to sign a copy of Silent to the Grave for me in hardcover and read it and loved it. And then started at the bookstore and there's Deanna all the time. So we're, we're big fans of hers. That's awesome. <laughs> she was actually our last physical in-store author event before everything shut down. Um, <laughs> at that point, Penguin Random House had started kind of pulling people in and saying like, that's it, everybody come home. But she was far enough along into the tour. They were like, look, you can finish or you can come home. And she was like, I have like one stop left. If I don't go to Houston, like I have to go to Houston. So she came, <laughs> hung out with us. We tried not to hug each other and had barbecue and then sent her on her way. And that was the middle of March. And that was the, the last in-store oh, author. Aw. That's cool though. <laughs> yeah, Good we, author to end on, at least in that sense. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, I'm going to be heartbroken if we don't get to see her. So I've got my fingers crossed that, you know, by the time March rolls around, we'll actually be able to do some in-store stuff again. Um, so I was just reading, um, so with the with the new book, um, Booklist called it The Perfect Combination. I think it was Booklist. Uh, let me find this so I have it right. Um, A book page said it, um, it will delight Agatha Christie and Daphne du Maurier fans. Um, who did you read kind of, as you said, you kind of, you were kind of reading and discovering kind of historical mystery stuff like that. And you said, you know, Rayburn, but like, did you read like kind of like Christie and du Maurier and those kind of early classics? Absolutely. Um, and it, I am a big Gothic book fan. I love Gothic. Um, I, Mary Stewart's my absolute favorite author, her like gothic romantic suspense books and Victoria Holt, even those kind of throwbacks. Um, so, you know, hearing Demare, Demare, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, cause, cause I do have those gothic undertones. I just, I'm really drawn to that, that melancholy, that, you know, that aura. So, um, but yeah, definitely those, um, and, you know, and like cl even classics like Jane Austen and Victor Hugo, I love, um, things like that. Um, but yeah, and then a lot of contemporary authors. Um, i trying to think of older authors, but anyway, <laughs> so. It's been really great in the last, I don't know, like year or two to see kind of that gothic thing kind of start coming back for a while. Like it just wasn't there at all. And, you know, Simone St. James started doing it. Yes. Gosh, like four or five years ago. And like at that point, like nobody was doing that. So she was kind of early on the like of the resurgence. So it's been really great to see all these kind of authors kind of starting to tackle the gothic again. Definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm eating it up. So. <laughs> Do you have a favorite Du Maurier? Um, I like to make it in That's and awesome. everybody loves Rebecca. <laughs> so. Yeah. Jamaica Inn and Frenchman's Creek are like the best for me. I love both of those. <laughs> Um, Cornwall is definitely on the, the bucket list of places yeah. that I need to get I've to. been there and it's oh. just, I have to tell you, so we stayed in Cornwall, we stayed just north of Land's End um, in this little village uh, called, called Senin Cove and we stayed, it was in this pub and it was above, above this pub and it's so funny because it's just was so peaceful, like 
because you could hear the ocean crashing against the rocks. I mean, like, I'm not a big beach person, but I love being at a rocky coast. There's just something about it. So Cornwall is just perfect. And so like when I'm really, really stressed, I'll go lay down and I'll close my eyes and I'll like imagine I'm there because I don't know why it was just, it just so captured me. I'm like, I must have Cornish relatives <laughs> or something, you know, like, um, and we went to, to, to Dagle Castle and, you know, it's great. You'll have to go there sometime. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, once, once we can travel again, that's definitely at the top of the list of places I want to get to. Um, so what do you think that both of your series have in common? Like what makes them an Annalie Huber book? I think a big thing for me is that I write um, women characters who are searching for their own happiness, their own, and they're not even completely um, eccentric outcast, like in a, in, a, in a really crazy way. It's more that, especially to our modern eyes, you know, they just want, they don't want to follow the cookie cutter mold that's set for them. They really are trying to just find their own happiness, their own their own path, and that it's just slightly off of what other people would have. Um, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, and just yeah, I don't I don't know. I think that's a big link in it. I guess. <laughs> do you think that your two main characters would get along if they met? I do. I think so. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely very different people, but I I think they would. They're, they see in others, they look beyond the superficial. So I think they would be able to see in each other the their strengths in that, so. Um, so when you're, you know, you know you're, said you're writing these characters that are kind of bucking the, bucking the traditions of kind of what's expected of them and kind of going their own way. How do you balance kind of creating these characters that still are doing stuff that people might not necessarily think that a woman at that time period would do so it still seems plausible to modern readers even even if it's still historically accurate right so we all know that when we when we've done research we all we, we all know that these women did exist like they're you know they they're way they were there there were women always women doing different things and um you know women artists you know women spies i mean it's there in the historical record but the the key is making it clear by the actions and the words of society of the society in the book of the other characters that they're they're out of the traditional mold that they're different that they're so it's really it's really just being able to shade it through the other eyes through the eyes of the society in that book to make it clear okay yeah these women are different so that you know the modern reader can see yeah this isn't this isn't the usual but it's possible so yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Um, and so we talked about this um, a month ago um, with the event for the Deadly Hours, but you just recently released an, a book called The Deadly Hour, Hours, which is an anthology collection with uh, Christine Trent, uh, C.S. Harris, and Susanna Kearsley. Can you tell everybody who's watching who might have missed that event a little bit about it? Sure, yeah. So it's uh, it was so much fun to write, and it's basically... Um, the the story of a journey of a pocket watch there's a cursed pocket watch or is it cursed um and it's um kind of passed down through history through these stories and um through the process of these stories you know it, it's is they're breaking a kind of a curse on it uh, or is there a curse um um and it was just so much fun it was it's really just this journey of this pocket watch is it cursed is it not and is it passes through the different eras and um some of us have um, characters from our other stories that are that are um, for example my book my novella within the deadly hours is a lady darby story so it's the lady darby characters christine's is a lady of ashes you know but um but like you know c.s harris candies is totally different characters so um so it's just a lot of fun it was just it's basically an anthology co connected by a cursed possibly cursed pocket watch passing through history and um what's going to happen to it and the people around it and so if you guys are watching, I just dropped a link to Deadly Hours in the comments on Facebook. So that way you can check that out as well. And if you want to catch the conversation, we had all four contributors together. Uh, you can go back through the stores, uh, live videos here on Facebook, where you can also check out the uh, YouTube channel for Murder by the Book. And we've got that conversation uploaded there. Um, it was so fun being able to, to chat with all four of you at the same time. That's kind of one of the great things about being able to do these virtual events as we're not limited by geography in the way that we are with the store. I agree because we're we're from all over the place. So that was that was a blast. <laughs> 
Um, did you, were you tempted at all? So you said this story was um, from uh, Lady Darby's perspective. Were you tempted at all to, to do um, it with, with Verity as a character instead? So it's interesting when we first um, put together the proposal for it, my Verity Kent series hadn't been bought yet. So it was initially the idea was the Lady Darby. And as we mentioned in, in our interview with that, we had a couple of hiccups and we had some authors drop out who will remain nameless. Um, and Candy was kind of brought in towards the end. And by that point, my Verity series had been picked up. And so I was kind of like, we knew we needed like a 20th century story. And I was like, well, I could switch and do Verity. I mean, cause you know, cause Candy does um, Regency with her Sebastian St. Series series. And she's like, no, no, no. The, everybody was like, no, no, no. They, it fits really well with the three we've got. And Candy was like, well, I really want to try something different. Um, and so it just, we were really glad we ended up with it the way we did. I was glad I didn't switch to Verity because her story at the end is just perfect. It's so good. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Gail mentioned just mentioned in the comments that the that that chat was really great. The book is fantastic too. So if you guys haven't picked that up, um, it's also a really great place to um, try some other authors if you aren't familiar with the other three. Um, who we we were so excited. I think uh, Candy had told us about it. Gosh, maybe a year or two ago uh, when she'd come at, come to the store. Even last year, I have no concept of time anymore, um, and had mentioned that they were working on it with the the collection of people that were involved and we were super excited to hear. So we were glad when we finally got to see it. I think one thing that people don't realize is kind of, and now that they do, because we're doing more of these online and people can see them if you haven't been to a book signing before, just the long process that publishing a book takes. So for you, from the time that you kind of turn in the rough draft to kind of publication, is it still about a year for you? Um. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's usually about a year. Uh, my deadlines, actually, I think I actually have a shorter, I don't know. I, I tend to turn in really clean manuscripts and I think that's part of it um, because I really do a lot of editing myself. So it's usually about 10 months for me out that I turn in the book and then it goes through all of the publishing drafts. But I know some people turn it in a year and a half earlier. So it kind of depends on the publisher. It kind of depends on the different things they're doing to push it. So who knows? <laughs> Um, and so when you have finished with one character or while, while you're working on one character, are you kind of thinking about what the other one's doing or is it like I am in this world and this is the world that I'm going to be until I'm, I'm done? Yeah, usually I'm, by the time I'm getting to the end of a book, I'm kind of chomping at the bit to start on the next one, um, which is really nice because it's like a, it, it keeps everything fresh. So it's like I never get sick of one series. It's like, you know, by the time I'm sick of a book and I'm like, come on, let's just get this done and turned in. Like, I'm so excited to work on the next one. And, it, and that's what it kind of goes back and forth about. And um, so, yeah, I'm definitely always thinking. And, and there's times too, when I'll get like a side idea, like, and if I have the time, I'll like give myself permission to just like work on it for a day, just to see if it turns into anything. And I think that keeps things fresh too, because it just lets you play. You know, it keeps writing, you know, writing is our work, but it keeps it also playful. So I think that's, uh, it's always great when authors are able to do that. Like we, uh, people who kind of like do standalones all the time, which we think is always great because then people kind of get so engrossed in a series, they don't necessarily want to give a standalone a chance, but you can always tell if an author just does one series, if they take a break and they do a standalone, when they come back to those characters, it's always fresh and you can tell that they've discovered, hey, I like this person again. I agree, definitely. Yeah, my goal was always to write two series because because of that exact reason you know and then I could also have two books releasing a year and it's just I'm I'm very grateful the way everything's turned out and I feel really blessed I mean so <laughs> so what are you working on right now I am working on Verdi Kent book five which will be out next um, autumn it's called Murder Most Fair um, and we are finally going back to um, Verdi's childhood home she's been avoiding it <laughs> so we're gonna meet her family and yeah so it's been a it's been a long time coming since the first book so yeah. it'll be interesting and it's around the holidays so <laughs> and uh when is your next uh lady darby um a wicked conceit is book nine and that comes out april 6th so coming up six months or so <laughs> and that so one is in edinburgh and um, and bonnie brock plays a big part of it. Um, that one was a lot of fun because it was. I found a, actually found a research book that like 
gave me this great idea and and I'm it's real I'm really excited about it so I'm hoping readers love it. <laughs> uh, so Keith asks what's the book that you have in the back of your mind that you want to write when you have the time? I have a couple um dual uh dual time period stories I'd like to write um there's one in particular um and I can't really give it away because once I kind of tell the plot it gives away a lot of it so um but yeah I have this I don't know, I have this idea. I just, uh, I gotta find the right way to do it. So, and I've gotta find the time too. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I definitely have, yeah, uh, several ideas that at some point I'm gonna pursue here. <laughs> so one of the things that I'm fascinated by for you guys as authors, so I'm sure like, and I hear you guys say all the time, like you have all these kind of ideas in your head. How do you know, like, this is the time for this idea, or this is the thing that maybe I'm not quite ready for, I'm gonna set it aside. How do you know that? Or is it something that you potentially get into something and realize maybe this isn't the time for it and you put it aside? For me, it's a gut thing. I, I don't know, like I can, you know, sometimes I have probably the first three chapters of I don't know how many ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's like when I've given my per per self permission to sit down and write it and then I go back and read it and I don't know it's a it's definitely a gut thing knowing okay this there's something to this, you know, or, you know, oh well I, I still really like this idea but there's something not working about this I need to like let it percolate and figure figure out why this isn't working so and sometimes too I've sent stuff to my agent and she just would be like I think we're missing a little bit let's wait on this so um, it's really invaluable to have somebody to bounce kind of some ideas off of too, definitely. Uh, what is one thing that surprised you most kind of about the publishing business? I think the time element. I mean, most people have no idea. And I, even me going into it, I kind of had an idea, like having done my research, but just how long, you know, there's so much time between things. You turn a book in and you don't hear from your editor for three months, you know, and so it's like, if you're not used to that and working on something else, you'll drive yourself crazy because you want to know whether they like it or not, you know, um, there's just, there's a lot of waiting, I'll put it that way. <laughs> publishing so and you know you know as I've gotten more prolific you know I'll, I'll, like I'm doing these events and then I'm like thinking back okay I wrote that book how long ago you know because <laughs> you've written other stuff since then and so then you're like I don't want to tell them the plot for something I'm that's not the right book you know <laughs> so it's fun <laughs> it's always the thing that's crazy like you said you know you're working on something else you're you know you're promoting something completely different I, I don't know how you guys manage to keep it straight. And then potentially, you know, people are always, when they're physically on tour, usually like, I'm trying to finish writing this book that's due while I'm on tour promoting another one. Yeah, they tend to be a, due a year out. So it's like, it's a little nuts. We're promoting and turning in a book at the same time. <laughs> And at least on the upside for you doing historical fiction, you don't potentially have to worry about like current events thwarting something that you're working on or turning up in a book in a weird way. That's true. Although it was a little eerie this year because the Lady Darby book touches on the cholera <laughs> epidemic <laughs> that uh, begins in England and Scotland. And um, I had known that was coming, you know, since I first started the, you know, years ago, mm -hmm. but of course had no idea that the book that starts it in, in the series, you know, that it first shows up that we would be in a pandemic at the same time. So um, it gave a very unique perspective. And, and as I was writing book nine, when they're still in the heart of this cholera epidemic, I really, I had to put an author note at the beginning of the book because I was just thinking, people are never gonna believe this is what people did. <laughs> you know, like, cause we're all so used to now the mass and the social distancing. And it's like, they did they had no concept, you know? So, and cholera wasn't even spread. I mean, cholera is spread by, you know, drinking poop water, you know? <laughs> so, I mean, contaminated water. So, you know, but at that time they didn't know that. So they weren't doing the right things at all, you know? So. Anyway, it was it was interesting writing it from that perspective because I was like, people are never going to believe this. I really had to. I was like, we really need to put an author note at the beginning because they're just not going to believe this. <laughs> and your your novella and Deadly Hours was kind of trippy like that too because it was also dealing with like kind of people on the sick ward and the saying like I was reading this yes. like, Ooh, too real, too real. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. And I had written that. It's it's funny. We laughed about this because we, it was such a long process writing the anthology. And Susanna jokes so much about this that it took her a long time. And, you know, so mine had been written, I don't know how many years ago. So yeah, it's, yeah, anyway. <laughs>
it's it's always fascinating to me how authors like thriller authors like everybody they kind of I guess maybe you're kind of just paying attention to everything in a different way than we are that like it happens so often that kind of books will line up with current events in just this weird way. Oh yeah. And you know, I'm going to bring this up for the Lady Darby book that comes out in April. Part of the book is about the police force in Edinburgh and whether they're corrupt or not. And I was writing this before all of the stuff happened in the summer. I mean, so, you know, it was when I, and I hadn't, I hadn't reread it. My, it had been like two and a half months when my editor finally got back to me in like August. And I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think. She's like, this is really eerie. Cause it was like, just, you know, anyway, it was, it is, it's, history just repeats itself. Anybody who studies it can just tell you that it just does. It just does. So. <laughs> Was there any temptation to potentially um, kind of tweak any of that stuff in the book dealing with the police issues because of everything happening? Or did you feel like, no, it definitely needs to be in there? Um, I didn't want to take it out. Definitely not because it's true to the time period. And I didn't really have mm -hmm. to tweak a lot because I, I had characters who were kind of looking at it from both side points, you know, viewpoints. I think you know, because you want to make it a, a full rich experience, you know, like, because ev everybody always has different opinions, obviously, you know, so um, yeah, I, I didn't have to tweak it too much. But yeah, it was definitely like a little bit of a, ooh, you know, like, <laughs> sometimes you would rather what you're writing and publishing not exactly mirror what's happening right then, because there will, there will be people who think that you're making a comment on modern events, and you're not, you're making a comment on human nature and past events, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if you guys have been watching, we've been chatting with Annalie Huber, whose newest book, A Pretty Deceit, uh, comes out tomorrow. We have um, copies of it at Murder by the Book. We have signed book plates to go with it. Um, Anna, do you recommend that people start with book four or start with book one? Can they jump in here? I have heard from both sides. Um, I think you can jump in anywhere. I try to write the book so you can jump in anywhere. But if you want the full arc of the characters, then you, you need to start with book one. Yeah, I would say. But you will totally be able to get into the story and understand the plot and the mysteries in the book without that. So. And I, if you guys are looking for book one, it is this side of murder. Like I said, we've got we've got both of them in stock. We've got signed book plates to go with them. I snag one. I do not have a signed book plate with me to, to Vanna White it, but we have signed book plates for them. <laughs> so you can order those at uh, murderbooks.com and we will get those sent out for you. We also have um, copies of The Deadly Hours. Uh, if you missed the first part of our chat, um, Facebook will archive it as soon as we are done. So you'll be able to catch up there. Um, and we'll also get it uploaded to the store's YouTube channel in the next couple of days. Uh, so you mentioned the new Lady Darby book comes out April 6th. Yes. Um, so we've got that to look forward to. Um, we thank everybody for joining us this evening. And it was so great to see you. It's been great to chat with you like twice in the last month. So hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed that kind of as the world starts to write itself, we'll actually get to, to get you back in the store. I think was the time that we did the joint event with you and Deanna, is that the only time that you've been to the store? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I would love to come back. Love it. Yeah. So, so we will we will get working on that as soon as we are it is all safe to travel again. Congratulations on the new book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Have a good night. You too. <laughs>